The ICC-Africa relationship has always been multifaceted and cannot be generalized. Let us firstly recall that African states were at the forefront of the push from over 120 states across the world to create the International Criminal Court. Without Africa's support in the period leading up, up to and during the 1998 Rome Conference, the ICC would not have been conceived. In February of 1999, it was no other than an African country, Senegal, that became the first state party to ratify the Rome Statute. This was a historically important step and a hugely important one symbol symbolically, soon followed by other states around the world. Senegal and countless other African state parties, as well as African civil society groups, continue to be the staunch supporters of international criminal justice and the ICC. African states have since provided significant support to the court and the office of the prosecutor, including by referring situations for investigations and by providing critical assistance to enable our operations. As the court implements its mandate with full independence and impartiality, it benefits in no small measure from the judicial and operational assistance of its states parties, including many African states, who provide cooperation in the context of investigations and prosecutions, such as to grant investigators access to sites or to military or, or other records to assist the court with the protection of witnesses or to ensure the arrest and surrender of persons who are sought by the court. This is not to say that the court has never been uh, a major bone of contention. Much of it is part of the public record, and there are several examples where tension was clearly visible. I will refer to the situation in Darfur, Sudan, just to demonstrate my point. Not long after the Office of the Prosecutor opened investigations into that situation, uh, Darfur, Sudan, this was in 2005, the then President Omar al-Bashir his regime ceased providing any form of cooperation. And this despite the situation having been referred to the ICC by the UN Security Council. ICC investigators were not allowed to set foot in Sudan. Despite these challenges, over the years, my office continued to exert every effort to collect evidence and strengthen our cases, even while warrants of arrest issued by the court remained outstanding for a considerable time. The arrest warrants issued against Mr. al-Bashir were a particular cause of criticism against the court, notwithstanding the irrelevance of official capacity under the Rome Statute. And Sudan managed to rally significant political support for its propaganda to falsely depict the court as an instrument of the West. And this false narrative has caused difficulty you will recall in this context also how a few years back, some African states were contemplating a possible mass withdrawal by African states parties from the Rome Statute, which fortunately did not materialize because many African states questioned the proposition. Throughout, we never lost focus and our dedication to our mandate and victims of atrocity crimes in Africa remained unwavering. And with the passage of time, in part, thanks also to the robust engagement by the court, including myself and my office, through travels to African capitals, seminars at the AU, and other engagements at the highest levels, things have slowly been turned around. Sudan has undergone an extraordinary political transition since 2019. Despite the volatile situation on the ground, and the restrictions posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the ICC was able to successfully achieve the surrender and transfer to the court of one of the suspects in the Darfur situation. On the 9th of June, 2020, Ali Mohammed Ali Abdel Rahman was brought into the custody of the ICC. He has meanwhile made his initial appearance before the ICC judges and a hearing to confirm the charges brought against him is scheduled for February of 2020, 2021, sorry. 
On the foundation of this successful operation and other developments, such as the peace deal signed in August between the Sudanese transitional government <clears throat> and most rebel groups, I was able last month to conduct a historical visit to Khartoum. And this was the first mission by the prosecution to Sudan since 2007. The meetings I had there, including with representatives from all parts of the government, were critically important to enhance understanding of the functioning of the court and to chart a course for effective cooperation with relevant authorities, including in preparation for proceedings related to Mr. Abdel Rahman, as well as in relation to the outstanding warrants against other suspects. My office will build on the success of this visit in the coming period to solidify arrangements for cooperation with the ultimate goal of contributing to bringing long-awaited justice to the victims in Darfur. This example shows that patience and perseverance and reliance on legal facts over political ad hoc decision making are necessary elements to ensure that the ICC can continue to deliver on its crucial mandate. By its very nature, the court frequently operates in fragile post-conflict situations during ongoing hostilities through politically charged election periods or against the backdrop of ongoing peace negotiations. Political stakes are usually high and the prospects of an investigation and prosecution by the ICC is also viewed through such prisms. It comes therefore as no surprise that at times when we become involved in a given situation following our strict legal mandate, we are erroneously accused of being political in our actions. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. As the track record of my office in particular demonstrates, I have and will continue to fulfill honorably and prof professionally my prosecutorial duties as mandated by the Rome Statute without fear or favor. This is the nature of the beast. The court does not do popularity contest. It does crucial work to fight impunity for the world's gravest crimes and hopefully through this work deter the commission of future crimes. To maintain the current helpful path, we must continuously acknowledge that fighting impunity for atrocity crimes and cultivating the rule of law are fundamental preconditions for a more peaceful and prosperous African continent, in fact, for any continent. International criminal justice is necessary if we are to have a less conflict-prone world, or at least to ensure that the law does not remain silent during otherwise lawless wars. That the victims of atrocity crimes are not forgotten. That they too have a voice. That they too count and have access to justice for the atrocities that have devastated their lives and livelihoods. The participation of states, including African states, in the Rome Statute and their continued support for the ICC in the discharge of its mandate is essential to global efforts to ensure accountability and strengthen the international rule of law. Support should extend to international and regional organizations, including the African Union. The court continues to engage with African states parties, both in the context of its operations and beyond. We work daily with judicial authorities in our states parties, including situation countries, to ensure we give life to the principle of complementarity and help each other. In the course of our common efforts, we see firsthand how much they are struggling as well as to achieve results, and we can only extend our call for support to all judicial mechanisms genuinely engaged in fighting impunity. We are working hard within the limited means at our disposal and respecting our legal mandate to also address persistent misconceptions, including on the continent, about the court's functioning. Raising awareness through outreach to ensure better understanding among local societies is also critically important to ensure that victims and affected communities can see justice being done.